So Geraint, we're back. Yes, yes. So, you know, we're still here in these pandemic times, but things are getting a little bit easier. So uh, what are we going to do this week? Well, we've combed through the many, many thousands, perhaps millions of comments that people are graciously leaving under our videos. Sorry, we don't really interact with those as much as we possibly should. But uh, we collect those all together and then make a video about the best ones. So I'm going to jump into a whole bunch of questions here from our wonderful viewers. And uh, we'll see how far we get through this. All right. So sounds good. A uh, question from Mitch Crane. And I'm going to mispronounce all of these names, um, perhaps deliberately. Uh, he says, I have a question about dark matter. We know dark matter doesn't clump together like the matter in stars and planets because dark matter doesn't bump into itself or into regular matter. But dark matter is clumped together on a bigger scale in and around galaxies. How did that happen? I mean, the answer is, is gravity, right? I mean, it's the mm. only thing that dark matter has to play with. So what we've got, of course, is in the early universe, soon after the Big Bang, mm -hmm. um, we know that matter was roughly smoothly distributed. If it was perfectly smoothly distributed, then mm -hmm. it would always stay that way. But there was this little ripple that was in the universe, uh, thought to come from inflation, where there are some places which are slightly more dense and some places which are slightly less dense. And gravity starts drawing matter in, right? things that are more dense have more matter in some location starts pulling matter out of the places where mm -hmm. less dense and stuff comes together and and you can calculate uh, i mean this is something that has been done uh, many times now you can calculate basically how clumps of matter would come together in, in that kind of picture and you end up with you know we, we call it you know a, a mass function right what's the distribution of lumps and chunks and stuff that you get when you have gravity just doing its thing and so with dark matter it's it's all gravity right so it, it, it things clump in on a certain size what's different with with gas of course is that gas has other physics mm. which uh, gas can collide with and in collisions you can lose energy and it can fragment it can collapse it can lose energy through radiation and that's why uh, galaxies and well, stars and galaxies can condense down to much smaller scales because mm. they can lose that sort of motion in, in spin, that angular momentum, whereas dark matter can't. It's trapped in these big, chunky distributions of matter. Yeah, so it's actually a slightly surprising thing. If you want to make a star, the first thing you do is to make very cold matter. And that's actually not easy to do because if... If, if all the matter is spread out on a big scale, by the time it falls in and collapses, and, it's mo and collapses, it's moving very quickly. And so if it just all collided with itself, it would make a very hot ball, but that's no good. That won't make a chunk that's star-sized. If you want a chunk of matter to sort of separate from the universe and make something star-sized, the first thing you've got to do is get the matter cold because those cold bits of matter will, 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 will break off into smaller chunks. So that's why there's a connection between where stars form and the, the coldest bits of matter in the universe in, in molecular clouds. With dark matter, there's no chance of cooling it off because it won't interact. And so it will only make big sort of galaxy and bigger sized chunks. Uh, and I think it's worth mentioning, uh, you know, one of the, the important names in this area um, is, is this astronomer from the early 1900s, James Jeans, mm, was somebody yes. who, who thought a lot about, if I have a cloud of gas and it's got these particular properties, temperature and density, et cetera. So if you imagine you've got a big cloud, you've got sort of gravity trying to make that cloud smaller, but it's got pressure, which is holding the gas up. What conditions do you get for that cloud to break up, fragment, Mm -hmm. And if it's going to do that, what sort of clumps are you going to get? Because, you know, it's not going to fragment into, you know, equal sized lumps, right? There'll be some big ones and some small ones. And again, this is reflected in the stars that we see. Uh, so most of the fragmentation gives you small lumps, leads to small stars. Mm -hmm. Every so often you get a big lump. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, there's some beautiful theory that was written out a hundred years ago now by James Jeans on this question of, what happens to gas clouds. But, uh, but I think it's also important to remember in all of this, 
to, to form stars, as you said, you need to have cold gas clouds, but to get gas clouds, you need to be able to pull gas in anyway. And in our universe, there was essentially a, a gravitational skeleton put in place by the dark matter. Mm. It was the dark matter that came together and the sort of gas came along for the ride, right? It was also drawn in by the same mm. gravitational power. So the, the stars and the galaxies that we can see are only really here because the dark matter has that gravitational interaction anyway. Yeah, I've got a book somewhere behind me by James Jeans, written uh, sort of an overview of astronomy, written in about 1930-ish, just when the expansion of the universe has been discovered by Hubble et al, Slipher and a bunch of other names there. And he still doesn't quite know what to make of it. It's really great reading. He's just sort of Oh, look, if this all pans out, we'll have to rethink about the overall structure of the universe. So, yeah, an excellent writer as well as a very, very good astrophysicist. Uh, can I can I check into James Jeans' anecdote yeah, here? You, you probably know this one, right? So James Jeans uh, had a rivalry. Uh, he had a rivalry with another of the great names in understanding our universe, mm -hmm. uh, and that was Arthur Eddington. And so Arthur Eddington also wanted to understand how stars work, but he was also a key player in uh, relativity. He was the, mm -hmm. the one that went off to measure the deflection of light by the sun, et cetera. And they had arguments about this entire thing about how, what happens to gas clouds, how the stars form. And there's a, there's a, a, a journal, which is you know, less important now than it used to be co called the observatory magazine, where th essentially they would write letters where they would argue over these things. <laughs> and they would also call each other sort of names in, in that sort of, <laughs> gentlemanly way that they did back in the 1920s uh, but the weird thing is of course is these two are at the same institution right they were both <laughs> at the they were both at the observatory in cambridge and their arguments were being played out on the pages of journals <laughs> and i must admit i do not know how they interacted in person but you know this rivalry is quite well known it was only one building back then of course it was only one building that's yeah, right but... <laughs> that's quite funny